wrap up chapter 13 here. As promised, we're going to talk about flooding. What we do when there's too much water. That doesn't happen everywhere, but lots of places do deal with flooding. And in talking about water is something we want to address. Now, there are things we can do to lessen the threat of flooding. Protect our wetlands. These are the natural areas that deal with excess water. But when we build on them, and especially build like shopping malls and parking lot, well, they're now not permeable. The water comes and it floods out into other areas. If we protect our wetlands, it's nature's way of dealing with excess water. That's what they are. So once again, protecting them and keeping the natural vegetation in our watersheds. Watersheds, where the water is coming down in river systems, right? The vegetation there helps prevent flooding. We'll kind of look at that here in a minute. And not building in areas subsequent to frequent flooding. It seems common sense, but we do it all the time. I lived in New Orleans for like three years while I was going to graduate school. And so much of New Orleans is built on floodplains. Original New Orleans is up in the high area. And then there were flood areas. Well, people began building there. And once we began building there, we have to find out ways to protect it. And when Katrina came and the dikes failed, this old lower than sea level area is what all flooded out. We're just literally building in an area that's subsequent to flooding. We'll talk about Bangladesh coming up here in a bit. And most of Bangladesh is actually just a flood plain. Um, people are there, but it just makes it difficult. We need to try to not develop in areas that are prone to flooding. Seems like common sense, but once again, common sense ain't always so common. Anyway, flood plains, like we talk about. Some areas just wind up getting too much water regularly. These are areas that flood when it overflows its channel. Like when I lived in Asia, uh, India, Thailand, they had monsoons, seasons where you just got loads and loads of rain and the rivers would overflow their banks every year there. Now farmers sort of counted on it. They'd expect it to overflow and then recede and then you got some nice silt, you got things to positive, you could grow your crops. But if it was too much, then it caused problems and it's hard to control how much rain we're gonna get. So these areas are very fertile for farming. Once again, the rains come, it washes down the silt, the nutrient, and it pours over the thing. The nutrients all get in there, even fish and et cetera, and microorganisms die. The floods come back, we have a super rich, fertile area. So people come there because it's rich and fertile for farming, but then you get flooded out. And these recharge, these areas are recharged the groundwater, they refill flood plain, you know, wetlands, etc. So these flood plains are very natural. They're part of just the normal cycle of things. But we actually do a lot of things that damage the flood plains. So if you take a look at the picture back here, it's where we kind of remove the vegetation. So on the left-hand side, this is kind of how it normally was. We have the forest there, and the forest gives way to kind of a grasslands. Then we have a river, and the floodplain would be this other side where we tend to grow crops. Well, if we come along, we begin deforesting, or well, we're removing vegetation. As we remove the vegetation, now when the rains come, the rains come and they wash more of the soil out. Soil leads to mudslides, landslides, more water comes down and it floods out this area. So it normally would get rain, but when we remove the vegetation, it winds up causing much more harm. Not to mention just global warming, the rising sea levels as ice melts, the seas rise, also just thermal expansion. If the temperatures rise a little bit, well, that's how a thermometer works, right? It gets warm and the liquid inside of it expands. So we realize how warm it is. A large body of water expands just a little bit and the waters rise. So even the rising sea levels have an effect on these floodplains because 
most of these floodplains are getting close near the ocean where it's putting out, where all the silt's getting deposited. Rising water levels cause issues everywhere. Now, I mentioned Bangladesh before, where I visited Bangladesh only a couple of times. We lived in India, lived in Nepal, but one of my companies did work in Bangladesh, and I was in Dhaka and some of the surrounding villages out near Dhaka. Dhaka is one of the big capital cities, but in Bangladesh. All of Bangladesh is basically a floodplain for multiple rivers coming down from the Himalayas. It's at a floodplain. The whole country is very low, right at sea level, but it has incredibly fertile soil. But in the past ooh, decade or so, there's really been an increased amount of severe flooding. This gives destruction of coastal wetlands, and they've done a lot of clearing out of their mangrove forest, sometimes for development, sometimes to do fish farms, etc. Getting rid of the mangrove forest also cuts down on storm damage, or it increases the storm damage, because the mangroves protect the energy from the ocean coming inland, but a lot of damage to those have hurt as well. They are doing a lot of things where they're adapting. Some of it is just using more plants that can deal with the salty water. So Bangladesh has been forced to deal with living in a floodplain. It's where most of their population lives, but they've had to do a lot of adaptions to get accustomed to it. And they actually sort of lead the world in a lot of these because they've had to do it for so long. But the past decade has been particularly rough just as the water and the problems have been exasperated with more runoff coming in. Another one of the things we need to do when it comes to reducing flood risks is rely on nature's built-in systems, wetlands and natural vegetation. We need to let the wetlands be. We don't need to try and take them over. We don't need to try and regulate them. And for heaven's sake, we don't need to develop on them. We need to let them take care of the natural flooding that occurs. We need to rely less on engineering devices. Now, when I've seen engineering devices, this is dams, levees, and channelizing streams. As you've read in the textbook, channelizing a stream is where I take a stream that's normally meandering and I put Debbie levees along it or dikes and I straighten it up so I can get the flow from here to there quicker. But when we do this, it creates other problems. It can solve one problem and can create three more. We need to rely a little less on these engineering devices because once again, dams come with another whole host of problems and they're limited in their lifespan. The silt builds up behind them and then we're stuck with a dam system which now isn't really working. So prevention, preserve the forest, preserve and reduce the wetlands, tax development. If anybody is gonna build on a wetlands, it needs to be heavily taxed. They need to have an incentive to not do it. And it's gotta be high enough to completely discourage it. And increase the use of floodplains for sustainable agriculture, once again and forestry. Let's use these floodplain areas and allow them to be more of a reserve or a preserve instead of trying to develop them. Uh, we can try and strengthen and deepen some of the streams. This once again sometimes help, causes some of its own problems, but we want to rely on as much as possible nature's solution. Nature's been doing it a long time. The closer we can get to how nature is taking care of things, Usually, the better off we are. Sometimes the simplest approach is often the best approach. Now the big ideas for this chapter is just that growing shortage of fresh water in many parts of the world. We can expand the water supplies in water short areas, once again by a lot of these different techniques, mainly diverting water to them. But the most important thing we need to do is reduce our overall water use, mainly by being more efficient with what we're doing. Reduce the water, use it more efficiently, cut out our water losses, raise prices, especially where it's needed. Leave the lifeline out there, but when you start using an excess amount, we've got to raise the prices on it, and we need to protect our aquifers, forests, 
and our other ecosystems that are the ones primarily storing and releasing water. We've got to have protections around these things or we're going to lose them. Guys, that is it for our chapter on water. Take care and we'll see you next time when we dive into our next chapter.